Hey guys, Sophie Line here, and we are here at the National Infantry Museum in Columbus, Georgia. This museum is rated consistently in the top three, if not the first, best museums in the US. And today, we're gonna take a little bit of a look, and we're gonna find out why. Let's go. All right, so we're here at the National Infantry Museum, and when you walk in those beautiful doors, this exhibit is one of the first ones that you're gonna see. And today, we're gonna tour the last 100 yards. This is gonna be our guide today. We're gonna to turn the camera over to him and allow him to introduce himself, some of his background, and then we're gonna go through. Come on. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Lewis. I'm the education director here uh, at the National Infantry Museum. I've uh, been here for about two, two and a half years. Uh, before that, I uh, served as an infantryman and paratrooper in the Army for about 31 years. Retired as a Sergeant Major here at Fort Benning back in 2020, and I made the transition over from uh, being active duty Army to a retiree right into this job. So I literally think I have the best retirement job in the world because I work in an air-conditioned building filled with guns. There we go. Not a bad gig. The last 100 yards our keynote exhibit here at the museum and it covers eight key battles in our nation's history from the Revolutionary War all the way through the Global War on Terror. And what it encapsulates is, so the last 100 yards is the hardest part of the infantry fight. That's when, uh, so an in infantry doctrine, so you, you have your support by fire in place that's putting machine gun rounds and suppressing the objective as the assault element gets set to begin their assault against the objective. Before that assault element can start moving on the objective, that support by fire has to lift and shift fire so they're not shooting at their own guys. So that's that last 100 yards. You have no close air support, you have no artillery, you have no mortars, you have no nothing. It's those infantrymen and infantry soldiers with the weapons in their hands using bounding techniques to move up that terrain to seize that object objective. No matter what type of terrain it is, no matter how tired they are, day, night, weather, doesn't make a difference. They're gonna seize that objective and, and, win, and, and win through the day. Um, so this exhibit talks about eight key battles over the span of our 200 years of our nation's history, the American infantry has made a difference uh, in key battles in our nation's history. Um, the other thing I wanted, before we head in, if you guys look up here, the, uh, the Combat Infantryman Badge. So the Combat Infantryman Badge is one of three premier combat awards that a soldier can get in the Army. You have the Combat Infantryman's Badge, uh, the Combat Action Badge, and the Combat Medical Badge. You have to be in what we call a two-way gunfight and come out on the plus side. So that's a very, when you see a soldier wearing that badge on their uniform, that means they've been deployed to places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, all the way back to the Second World War when it was, that's the first time the badge was uh, awarded. So it's kind of a big deal when you see someone with that combat infantry badge, uh, combat infantryman's badge on their shirt because they've been there, done that, and been in that kind of last 100 yards concept and come out on the plus side. So one of those things. So. Without further ado, let's head in. Let's go. So as we come into the last 100 yards, you'll see, we call this the drum. You'll see in these glass tablets, these are what we call uh, the Army values. The Army values are kind of the cornerstone basis of the Army as an organization. Uh, we use a quick, we use a very simple acronym for that, so leadership. So loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. Those are the basic values that we train that we teach soldiers on the, on the enlisted and the officer side and carry through them during their entire career. So that's why we kind of have it here at the base, at the entrance of this exhibit, because it's kind of the cornerstone of our army as we exist today. So if, as we head in, so where do we come from as an army? So this, this, uh, this figure that you see here, this is a generic representation of one of the colonial militiamen that stood up to the British at Lexington and Concord, the shot heard around the world in April of 1775 that began the American Revolution. Um, they weren't professionally trained soldiers. They were, they were citizen soldiers that were, had left the United, you know, left England to get away from the oppression of the British. They come to the United States, they come to the, you know, the 13 colonies, and then they're getting mixed up with it again. So they said, okay, we've had enough. So the basis of our army really still exists in that citizen soldier concept. Now, the Army's birthday is 14 June 1775. Why is it that day? So on 14 June 1775, the Second Continental Congress authorizes the establishment of 10 companies of infantry. So that is, and that is the genesis of the infantry and the United States Army. What happens a year, almost 10 months later in July 1776? Or we declare independence. Right, so the, so the Army has been around longer than the United States has. So we kind of have a, as long, as well as all, most of the military branches. It's kind of a big deal to be that, and, and, and you know, intertwined with our country's history, even, in, even today. 
So this part of the exhibit for the, for the American Revolution, we talk about the Battle of Yorktown, which was the last major engagement between the American Continental Army and the British Army during the American Revolution. Uh, more specifically, we, we talk about this part, component of that battle, which was the Battle at Redoubt Number 10. So the outcome of this battle, the odds were stacked against us hugely, um, based on numbers and experience. Uh, the last major pocket of British Army resistance was forced into a defensive perimeter in and around the town of Yorktown, Virginia. 8,000 British soldiers. Now, we didn't want to fight 8,000 Brits because they were still the most professionally trained lethal army that had ever walked the face of the earth. So here's where the outside the box thinking of the American infantry even shows up even over 200 years ago. So imagine a circular perimeter around Yorktown. At certain pieces of key terrain, they built large strong point defensive positions called redoubts. And this is what you see here. This is redoubt number 10. Pretty, pretty impregnable position to take. Manned by about 80 British soldiers, <coughs> excuse me, about 85 British soldiers. And the base of the redoubt had these wooden pikes or abatis that were dug in around it. So it was a pretty tough nut to crack. So in October 1781, when this fight was happening, here's where the outside the box thinking American infantry comes into play. They knew if they, so the thinking was if they could take this position along with the adjoining redoubt number nine, those two redoubts were about 350 yards away from each other. If they could seize both those redoubts, Simultaneously, that would create a gap in the British Army's defensive positions, and they could hopefully like force the British to the bargaining table because we still didn't want to fight 8,000 British soldiers because that's that's a lot of dudes. <laughs> um, so a little bit after midnight, a force of about 400 American infantry set out towards Redoubt Number 10. The same number of French infantry head out towards Redoubt Number 9. And the plan was a slow creep, move across open terrain, get to the base of the Redoubt, each respective Redoubt. The sun was coming up, and they'd hit each Redoubt cut through the wooden abatis, get in and seize it. Now here's the amazing thing, the 400 American infantry that set out that little bit after midnight under, under cover of an artillery barrage, when they moved out, they had single shot muskets like you see here, bayonets fixed, but not one of those muskets was loaded. Now why would you want to have 400 guys moving at night, basically doing a night infiltration into a deliberate attack with unloaded weapons? One reason only, what if one of the muskets went off? It would alert the British like, hey, there's some bros out there, what's, what's going on? So it worked. They get to the base of the redoubt right, right at dawn. The Brits see them. They start exchanging musket fire. But regardless, they manage to cut through the wooden abatis, get into the redoubt, and seize it in about an hour. Simultaneously, the French were able to do that with redoubt number nine. <clears throat> so in the span of an hour after, sunlight, or after sunrise, there's a 350-yard open gap in the British defensive positions. Now, news goes like wildfire for the British lines because there's no place for them to retreat to. And they were like, what, what's going to happen next? Later that day, the British asked for a formal parley to discuss what's going to happen next. And the following day, the entire 8,000-man garrison surrenders, yeah. which basically ends any kind of offensive capabilities the British Army has in the 13 colonies. And a year later, leads to the Treaty of Paris being signed in 1783, which formally ends the American Revolution and guarantees the existence of the United States of America as we know it right now. And who do we have to thank that for? About 400 American infantry and our French counterparts. So it's kind of neat to when the soldiers come here, I'm like, that's the shoes you're getting ready to step into. Yeah. Um, a couple of highlights about this exhibit I'd like to show. If you look up here at the top, so the guy that you see with the sword in his hand, he's the infantry lieutenant colonel that leads the attack on Redoubt Number 10 that morning. You guys might have heard of his name before. His name is Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Hamilton. Thanks. Hamilton was Washington's adjutant at Yorktown, and he kind of pushed pretty hard to be able to lead this attack in, because a lot of people thought it was going to be the last major engagement um, of the war. And if you look real closely here, this first soldier coming through the parapet, if you look closely at his facial features, he's an African-American soldier. So there were 25 to 30 soldiers from the 1st Rhode Island Regiment that are part of the attack on Redoubt Number 10. What's significant about the 1st Rhode Island, about 70% of that regiment was made up of freed African-American slaves. So we talk about cultural inclusion, all the things going on in society and around the world the past few years. We've had African-American soldiers in our army since day one. Always has been and always will be. I mean, it's kind of a neat thing. A lot of people don't realize unless you study the battle. So. Yeah, yeah. And then the, so about that, each one of the figures that you see in this exhibit specifically was a soldier here at Fort Benning back in 2007. Mm. They asked for volunteers, hey, do you want to be part of the infantry museum? They got 300 names. They picked 30 soldiers. So each one of these, as we go in this exhibit, you know, they had to stand like this for about three hours as they cast them. Mm. They cut the uniforms and equipment specifically to their body dimensions. 
and then and then put the figures in here. And we have a book up front that says who's who because every once in a while they show up. That's so cool. And kind of say you were literally in the entry museum. So That's so kinda, cool. Doesn't these aren't department store mannequins that were kind of yeah. they were purposely built for all these specific things. So oh, kind of cool. That's yeah, beautiful. Yeah. beautiful. All right, let's have the Civil War. All right, let's go. So in 17 September 1862, it is the largest uh, loss of life in a single day in our Army's history. So combined dead and wounded from both the Union and Confederate armies at the Battle of Antietam on that day, 23,000 soldiers were either killed or wounded in one day of fight. Now, to, to give you a size relation, the 82nd Airborne Division right now can field between 18 and 19,000 paratroopers in that division. So you're talking about almost in a division and a half worth of casualties in one day of fighting. So imagine if like you turned on the news tomorrow and saw that that we took 23,000 casualties in the, I mean, that's, that's unbelievable. Yeah. So how did that happen? This is where we start seeing technology kind of creep its way into the battlefield. So on one, the, the Antietam National Battlefields sits just south, right outside of Washington, D.C., um, outside of a town called Sharpsburg, Maryland. Um, the, the, the key component of this fight was control for what was known as the Burnsides Bridge. And that's what you see here, a much smaller scale replica of it. Now the neat thing, if you go to the Antietam National Battlefield today, the actual bridge is still there. Very well constructed, made out of stone, brick, and mortar. But if you controlled that bridge, you controlled freedom of movement over the Antietam Creek, which is a natural water obstacle. So that's why it became the focal point of the fight that day. On one side of the bridge were about 30,000 Union infantry arranged in regiments that were maneuvering towards establishing a, a, a bridgehead on one side of the bridge to assault and seize it. Now, if you look across the bridge, on the other side of the bridge, on the high ground, with pretty good cover and concealment, yeah. were 450 Confederates from the state of Georgia. Now, those 450 Confederates were led, led by a brevet colonel from Columbus named Henry Bennett. That's where Fort Bennett gets his name from. Now, despite their, they were basically outnumbered about 250 to 1. But despite that, they were able to hold off three attacks by a vastly numerically superior force in the Union Army before the third attack of the day, they just got overwhelmed and they had to withdraw. How could 450 guys hold off all those, all those other, you know, the, the Union soldiers? Pretty simple. So they had the high ground, they had excellent cover and concealment, and then we call this, in, in infantry terminology and in Army terminology, what, kind of, what type of target is this bridge? It's a linear target, what we call a fatal funnel. So as every Union Army doctrine was, you would just run across the bridge and get as much combat power, and that's how you seized it. And they just, they had the high ground, and they had, they could look down and see. I mean, there's no cover on this bridge, and that kind of led to a lot of the loss of life that day. The technology piece was, the, the, uh, the, the, the Confederates had bought on the black market from the British Enfield rifles. What's significant about the Enfield, they were single-shot muskets, but they had rifle barrels. So that's where the technology piece comes in, is that they had actually superior small arms, training, high ground, all that kind of stuff. So they really let the Union Army have it that day. The third attack of the day, and the first Union soldier to make it across the bridge, is this guy you see here. This is Captain William Meadow. Captain Meadow commanded Charlie Company of the 51st Pennsylvania Infantry, and leading his company in the attack across the bridge that day, he's widely regarded as being the first Union soldier to make it across the bridge. So pretty, pretty devastating fight in our Army's history. Um, and on a side note of how you can say how the Army influences politics and history, despite the staggering losses taken at the bridge, this fight gave President Lincoln confidence that the Union Army would be able to defeat the Confederates. A few days after this fight, he issues his Emancipation Proclamation outlawing slavery in the United States. Um, so here's a clear example of how the capability of our Army affects uh, politics and world history and all that kind of stuff. So kind of an important day. All right, except World War I. During World War I, uh, the, uh, before we start specifically about the Battle of Sosans, I'm going to ask you a simple question. It's the same question I ask soldiers or whoever I'm, when I'm giving a tour. Um, real simple question. Does warfare affect technology or does technology affect warfare? Oh, I can see both. There you go. And, that, it just, and the reason why I ask that question is a lot of people kind of don't think of it that way as they come to a military museum. But in my humble opinion, I think more technological advancement in warfare as we know it right now shows up in the battlefields of Europe during the First World War than at any other point in time in the past 200 years. Because mm -hmm. think about it, during the First World War, you see the introduction of tanks, chemical weapons, use of aircraft, machine guns, and flamethrowers. You can go on and on and on and on that still affect how we train here at Fort Benning and other installations all around the world. 
Um, so the, the Battle of Soissons, which was fought in July 1918, the significance of this fight, it's the first time American infantry faces off against the Germans uh, in combat during the First World War. So the Doughboys of the 1st and 2nd Divisions, along with the 5th Marines, attack uh, the Germans in their defense positions at Soissons. Despite taking 5,700 casualties, they managed to push the Germans out of their defensive positions and cause them to withdraw. That begins what's called the 100-day offensive. So at any point in time, from that point forward, when the Americans attack the Germans in their, one of their positions, along with our French and British counterparts, um, the Germans lost. And all that real estate they had seized in Western Europe in the early part of the war, they kept losing it and losing it and losing it. Uh, until on the 11th hour, or the 11th day, or the 11th month. 1100 hours and 11 November 1918, the armistice goes into effect, ending the First World War. Right. And of course, what do we celebrate every year on the 11th of November now? Uh, Veterans Day. So that's kind of tying to that. Okay. So take a look at these three doughboys, these three figures here, okay? What do we, from a technological standpoint, what do we see about them, equipment wise, that we don't see in the soldiers from the American Revolution or from the Civil War? Helmets on? They, that, that's probably the number one thing. The, yeah. the M1917 Kelly helmets, copy of the British design. Not that fancy a molded piece of steel with a headband and chin strap, but it was the first time protective equipment was issued to soldiers in combat in our Army's history. Look at the equipment they're carrying cartridge belts, haversacks, canteens. They're wearing boots with leggings. So now they're carrying more equipment for sustained operations in a field environment <coughs> for that kind of stuff. Bolt action 30 caliber M1903 Springfield rifle, five round internal magazine, and each of the pockets on the cartridge belt carry two five round stripper clips. Mm -hmm. So each soldier now has got 100 rounds of ammunition on them, so that ups the volume of firepower that that infantry squad can deliver on the battlefield. The lieutenant up here has the uh, M1911 45 caliber semi automatic handgun in his hand. First wide scale issue of a semi automatic pistol in Army's history. And my carry piece, you can't go wrong. Okay. <laughs> um, here's the big thing. The square pouches on their chest, what do you think those are? What's one of the, characteristically one of the most terrible or terrifying weapon systems that shows up on the battlefields of Europe during the First World War? Gas. There you go. That's your gas mask. Okay. So again, that technology versus warfare thing, we didn't train for gas masks or, or for chemical weapons at, you know, at the beginning of the war, but we sure as heck were, because what were the chances of them getting hit with a chemical agent during the First World War? Pretty high. Yeah. So one of those, that's why I asked that question about technology versus warfare. Absolutely. Let's head to World War II. Okay. Um, here at Fort Benning during World War II, we trained thousands and thousands of infantry, armor crew members, officer cannon school, all kinds of stuff during the war. One of the most important technological ev events that happens here, so on 16 August 1940, the parachute test platoon conducts, conducts the Army's first parachute jump ever right out on Lawson Army Airfield here at Fort Benning. 46 enlisted and two officers. First Army parachutes ever. Now here's the amazing thing. Five years later, in August of 1945, at the end of World War II, we basically went from having a platoon size element of parachutists in 1940, 1945, we had five airborne divisions. That's over 80,000 soldiers trained as either parachutists, and we'll talk about this guy here in a second, or as glider infantry. And they did that without Microsoft Office or PowerPoint or iPhones or all that kind of, kind of stuff. Now, parachute infantry, obviously they, they, they land on the battlefield by parachute. How did glider infantrymen go to combat? So I want you to take a look up at that aircraft right there. Oh, wow. That is one of 11 surviving actual Waco CG-4A gliders used by glider units during the Second World War. Uh, it's made out of plywood, metal tubing, and canvas. It could carry 6,000 pounds of equipment, a Willys Jeep, an artillery piece, or a 13-man infantry section. So the aircraft would be towed behind a twin-engine C-46 or C-47 aircraft. The pilot and the co-pilot sat in the front of the glider. When they arrived over their designated landing zone, they had about a 350-foot-long tow cable, they would detach the tow cable from inside the glider, and the glider would hopefully land safely on the landing zone below. Um, when you see pictures of gliders, when they crashed, uh, they, they crashed horribly. Oh, in the early morning hours of D-Day, over 13,000 paratroopers from the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions were dropped into drop zones behind Utah Beach from, um, um, I mean, massive amount of, of combat power. By the 8th of June, over 8,000 glidermen and their weapons, equipment, vehicles, all kind of stuff, were brought from into Normandy from 24 different airfields in the UK across the English Channel in those aircraft. Wow. And it's a single use airframe. Mm -hmm. um, here's the bad thing if you were the pilot or the co pilot on the glider, once the glider landed, what did you become? Oh, you became an infantryman. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. just one, one, one of those things. Um, keeping on the theme of D Day, uh, so the 2nd Ranger Battalion, Point to Hawk. 
arguably one of the most key components of the invasion of Normandy on the morning of June 6th. Point de Hoc uh, is a 100 foot tall cliff that points like a finger out in the English Channel and it's situated halfway between what would eventually become Utah and Omaha beaches, the two main landing beaches on D-Day. Uh, top of the cliffs had a bunch of concrete bunkers and, and positions to support uh, six German 155 uh, millimeter field guns, they're actually French guns, but the Germans had captured them. Um, big issue because it could, of course, they could range both landing beaches. So who do you give impossible missions to? You give it to the Rangers. So the 225 Rangers of the 2nd Ranger Battalion, led by Lieutenant Colonel James Rudder, are given the mission to seize Point to Hawk, and it would have been the opening action on D-Day. Um, now, if you have ever been to Normandy, or if you ever get the chance to go, please go, and go see this place. There's no landing beach in front of Point to Hawk. It's a little rocky shale, and the cliffs go straight up. Um, so they had to develop techniques of how to quickly get up the cliffs and seize those positions. The most effective technique they came up with was they had a, a, they had, uh, a series of rocket, like line throwing rocket launchers that were mounted in each of the landing craft. So as the landing craft came in, at a certain point, they would fire these rocket launchers that would have basically a grappling hook, it would go over the top of the cliff, and those rangers inside the landing craft would pull on ropes until it locked onto something, and then they started climbing. So how much upper body strength do you think that ranger has? He's got about 85 pounds of kit on him, soaking wet and he's got a weapon. Mm. And he's not tied in with a Swiss seat. That's all, that's all like, maybe a little fear and adrenaline too going on that as well. Um, they get to the top of Point to Hawk, they look for the guns, but there was one big problem. The guns were gone. Mm. And the days leading up to D-Day, both the RAF and our Army Air Corps had been bombing the hell out of Point to Hawk. The Germans moved the guns on their wheeled carriages to a field about two kilometers inland. Rangers get up, they find out the guns are gone, they send patrols out, they find the guns, disable the firing me mechanisms, and pull back into Point Hawk because they had to hold it for 48 hours. Mm -hmm. On the 8th of June, when they were finally relieved by forces from the 1st Infantry Division that landed at Omaha Beach, of the 225 that set out the morning of June 6th, there were 90 of them left. And every single one of them was wounded because there was no place for them to get medevac to. They were holding on to that piece of terrain no matter what it took. Mm -hmm. So, huge piece in our Army's history. Now, a little side note. if you. If you've ever read the book Black Hawk Down or, or done any, seen the film or whatever, there's a guy in that, actually he was here yesterday, his name is Jeff Struker. So he was a Staff Sergeant Ranger in Bravo Company, 3rd Ranger Battalion, uh, 75th Ranger Regiment, and in Mogadishu for the whole Black Hawk Down incident. He actually got out of the Army, came back, went to uh, seminary, came back as a chaplain. So now you have an Army chaplain with a combat jump, CIB, Ranger Tab, and, and great guy. Uh, and he retired. Uh, out of the army a few years ago and still lives here in Columbus. Uh, preaches here uh, in Columbus. But the guy you see here sitting on the ground with the handy talk in his hand, that's him. And notice the hair part, his hair looks good. You know, you have to have, you know, it'll look, it'll look good for combat, one of those important things. Absolutely. Last thing here about World War II, recapturing the rock. So you may have heard that the, 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 the 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment the rock, is nicknamed the Rock. And they got that nickname because they jumped on the island of Corregidor in the Philippines on 16 February 1945. That's the actual combat jump footage you can see in that parachute canopy right now. Corregidor sits in the mouth of Manila Bay. It's a small four mile long island. It's actually the last piece of Philippine territory that MacArthur stood on before he had to evacuate out of the Philippines because the Japanese had, were coming in and eventually did take Corregidor. So, Corregidor, so uh, MacArthur wanted it back. So the morning of 16 February 1945, the 3rd Battalion, the 503rd, jumps in the top side of Corregidor um, a little bit after 8 o'clock in the morning. Catch the Japanese completely by surprise because this is what the drop zone looked like. Broken trees and shell craters and hunks of concrete and it was, it was not a suitable drop zone at all. But they, they did achieve the uh, complete surprise and managed to get a toehold on the island. Now at 12.30 that day, the 2nd of the 503rd comes in. That's the footage you see inside the parachute right now, but big problem. When 2nd Battalion jumps, winds were 25 gusting to 35 miles an hour. You don't jump in 25 mile an hour winds, you just yeah. don't. Yeah. But they had a battalion on the ground, which they couldn't leave them hanging. So the regimental commander was in that second flight of aircraft and he made a decision, we're still going in. But instead of jumping at 650 feet, they jumped at 400 feet. So no need for a reserve parachute. At 400 feet, either your parachute's opening or it's not opening. Um, but they still managed to get uh, most of the 2nd Battalion on the, on the island uh, uh, safely and successfully. 
After 10 days of fighting of the estimated 4,600 Japanese soldiers on the island, when they finally secured, they captured less than 200. They were just fighting to the death. And this was the end of the war. The closer we got towards mainland Japan, the more savage the Japanese were going to fight, that kind of stuff. But yeah, I, for two, 400 feet, like, <laughs> that's a special type of human being to be able to do a, do a jump like that. Michael and I have numerous static line jumps. I think the lowest I've jumped was 600, uh, and that was pretty eye-opening. The towers on, when you see the towers of the airfield on base, it's like yep. 230. They're 250. So you, oh, yeah, 250. 250. Yeah. So it's less than two of those. Right. Whoa. Yeah. That's and you need, so in, in kind of parachute technology stuff, the static line parachutes that we use, um, and even back then, the T5 and T7 parachutes, you need 250 feet of altitude when you come out of the airplane for the parachute to f open it up to where it slows you down. Yeah, so they were like in the air for maybe 15 seconds. Yeah, un unbelievable. So, okay, so during the Korean War, uh, in February 1951, the guy you see up front with his patrol cap with the brim folded up on mm -hmm. it, his name is Captain Louis Millet. Captain Millet led a company in the 25th Infantry Division during the Korean War. His biggest claim to fame is he leads the last known bayonet attack in our Army's history. So Millet, um, his company is conducting a, an attack against this ridge line at a place called Soamni, which is now in South Korea. And there was a, uh, a series of North Korean machine gun positions at the top of that ridge. This, this lead machine gun position engages his lead platoon and they, they're pinned down. They can't move because they're really putting a lot of effective machine gun fire on them. Millet actually calls back for reinforcements to see if they can get tanks up there. Or, but more, the other thing is they were running super low on rifle ammunition. Uh, battalion says you're going to have to wait. They'll, they're trying to work some stuff out. Uh, Millet is an impatient Irishman from Mechanic Falls, Maine. So I like how he thinks. And he literally says the hell with that. And he gives a command, fix bayonets, follow me, let's go. Now he trained his company in bayonet fighting techniques. And everybody thought it was like an outmoded, outmoded antiquated form of, of warfare. But when the company commander takes that 10-inch blade out of his scabbard, puts it in the end of his M1 and says, fix bayonets, there's not one guy in his company that doesn't follow suit. He takes the other two platoons on a direct attack up the ridge line. When they get to the top of the ridge, there's a communications trench that was dug between two of the machine gun positions. He jumps in the trench. There's three North Korean soldiers looking at him. He bayonets and kills all three of them. Rallies the rest of his company up to the ridge line. And when the fight was done, there were over 120 dead North Korean soldiers on that ridge line. 12 of them have been killed with bayonets. He gets wounded in both legs by shrapnel from grenades or mortars, but refuses to get medevac until the ridge line's secure, and they have accountability of all the guys in his company. And for his actions that day, he gets a Medal of Honor from President Truman. Now, you got to lead like you fight, and you have to inspire confidence in your soldiers. His bold action could have been termed what could have been a very bad day for his company into a resounding success. But I'll tell you, as a veteran, Michael and I, both combat veterans of trips to dusty faraway countries, I'm, I think I speak for the two of us when I say we are very glad we have never heard our commanders say to us, fix bayonets. Because you're probably gonna have a building at Fort Benning named after you and not in a good way, like yeah. <laughs> that kind of stuff. So this guy gets put in for the Medal of Honor. Right. Oh, what yeah. ends up happening? The Human, Human Resources Command says he's pending in Article 15, mm -hmm. so he's not eligible for a Medal of Honor. So they had to give him his article, remember for yeah. the AWOL, when he was in World War One, excuse me, yeah. World War Two, as a private, he went AWOL because his unit wasn't fighting enough for him. So he left, went and joined a Canadian unit, got into the scuffle, and had a pending court martial for, for absent for without leave during wartime. And they kind of just went, oh, "You're okay." So they were like, "Well, let's process you. Did you do it? Yep. All right." Here's your slap on the wrist. By the way, here's your Medal of Honor. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Built different. Yeah. And the neat thing, too, um, when they, when we were building this exhibit, Colonel Millette was still alive, so that's his facial likeness. Oh, wow. On that, on that figure. That's actually him. That's cool. Okay, so I'm sure you've either read the book We Were Soldiers Once and Young by Lieutenant General Al Moore or have seen, or have seen the Mel Gibson film, We Were Soldiers, about the Vietnam War. This is what this exhibit talks about, the Battle of Landing Zone X-ray in the Idrang Valley in November 1965. So what's the, why, we, why is it so important to have the Huey here? So the, that battle was the first time an entire infantry battalion was moved into combat against an enemy force with the Huey helicopter. Mm -hmm. So from a technological standpoint, um, th this was a big deal. Uh, Huey was the first turbine-powered air helicopter to be used in our Army's inventory. And in fact, all the doctrine of how we we're going to use the Huey in combat was developed here at Fort Benning in the early 1960s. 
So November 1965, the 1st Cavalry Division, Air Mobile, is in South Vietnam. Uh, they get reports that there are about 200 enemy soldiers, North Vietnamese Army soldiers, operating in a place called the Aya Drang Valley, which sits up against the Cambodian border in the Central Highlands of South Vietnam. So the 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry, led by Lieutenant Colonel uh, Hal Moore, is airlifted into the valley to clear it of enemy activity. Well, when that first lift goes in, the landing zone was about the size of a football field, which means only five to six aircraft could go in a lift. You have to have spatial dispersion between, airframe, between aircraft for one big reason. Like, rotors can't touch each other. That's, right. that's kind of bad. So, right. Right? so that's why that first lift only had about five or six aircraft. So, and they were on the ground on their own for about 40 minutes mm -hmm. because it was a 20-minute round trip, 20 minutes to get back to the air base, to their, to their forward operating base or where they were, pick up the next lift and come in. So if you read the book or seen from the film, there wasn't just 200 enemy soldiers. When they landed in the valley, they landed in the backyard of an almost 4,000 man North Vietnamese Army Regiment. So how did they hold their own? They were, they were outnumbered eight to one, even before the fight started. How could they hold their own against a much larger enemy force over a four day battle? That aircraft right there. It could bring in resupplies, it could uh, bring in reinforcements, it could take out the wounded, and there were modified versions used as gunships. It solidified the concept that the, the helicopter was now gonna be could definitely be the, the next way to get after it, uh, to conduct combat operations anywhere around the world, and it's still how we operate today. Um, the video footage on the other side of the aircraft is actual footage from the landing zone x-ray. So this actual airframe was built in 1964, and it flew in Vietnam with the 1st Cavalry Division from 1966 to early 1968. Um, it was being used at Fort Rucker, which is the Army's aviation school, about three hours away from us here in Alabama as an instructional airframe teaching kids how to fix helicopters. When we found out the history behind it, uh, they agreed to donate it to us, um, but the neat thing we had to do is in the 40 years of operational existence of the aircraft, and it had so many modifications and things built to it, that we had to retrograde it to make it look like what you would have looked like in 1965. You saw the inside of a Black Hawk. Right. So, come on up. Yeah, come on up. If you sit down, Pack a Marlboro light, right. and that would be that would be uh, authentic. But this is you notice how small it is right. as compared to well, it was a virtual reality experience. So I'll give you that, but it's it's eleven. This was eleven if total, you're lucky, including the crew. Mm -hmm. Whereas on a Black Hawk, we can go sixteen passengers. Right. So uh, this is the workhorse and more military history from my family. Father flew one of these for a quarter century. Oh. Vietnam, right up until the late 90s. Yeah. It is good. the Cadillac of the skies. It, it is it's a There's, awesome airframe. And it's, There's nothing it can't do. The thump, thump, thump. Yep. That's this helicopter. So, yeah. yeah. That's really cool that you got, like, well, the real one that had it. And it, you can find a, the provenance with, yep. with every vehicle's history. Yeah. Like, it just, it's really cool that that's available. It's all, I mean, you have a vehicle and it, bring, it helps bring. It helps bring an exhibit to life, of course, but right. when you have one that has the provenance, it has yep. a story, like it was there too, and yep. it has its own story, that's, that's, that's pretty, super cool. We yeah, got the beautiful. history of the aircraft all the way up to 2004, all the places it was and where it was used, and the Vietnam Helicopter Pods Association, they maintain a database of every aircraft that flew in Vietnam, and that's where I got it from, there a great bunch of guys. That's really cool. Yep. Yeah, if we can get you an old M16 and Peck of Marlboros, it'd be yeah. a <laughs> <laughs> You know, I flew in my dad's helicopter. Did you really? And they still had, no kidding. They're ashtrays. The ashtrays yeah. on the back oh, wow. of the pilot seat. Yeah, and in the cockpit, yeah. in the cockpit, there's an ashtray. Wow. And it says yep. Bell, Bell Aircraft on yep. it. Yeah. Huh. So our M2A2 Bradley fighting vehicle. Of course, I know you're very familiar with these vehicles. Um, I watch, I watch your YouTube channel. I, I know you've been at Bradley, <laughs> but this is a unique one. So Bravo 14 was assigned to First Battalion, 22nd Infantry of the Fourth Infantry Division. This actual vehicle was in operation in Iraqi Freedom. And of course, the Bradley fighting vehicle, tremendous platform uh, for our mechanized infantry forces, the 25 millimeter chain gun, the 7.62 coax, dual tow launcher, and of course, the six-man dismount squad that comes out of the back of it. Now, the, the vehicle has a unique history. In operations in Iraq, it was actually hit by an IED three times. Ooh. The first two IEDs were small devices, did very minimal damage to the vehicle, and it was quickly repaired and put back into operation. However, uh, in October 2003, when the IED threat in Iraq was expanding exponentially, the vehicle actually drove over a pressure plate IED that had two 152 millimeter howitzer rounds daisy chain together. Jeez. It was the front right side road wheel that triggered it. Uh, unfortunately, the blast killed the driver, wounded a guy in the turret, but the rest of the guys were able to get out of the vehicle. 
vehicle is a catastrophic loss. We actually, I've, we've had guys that were in this unit come here to the museum and show me pictures of what the vehicle looked like and when they recovered it. I mean, it was burnt out, it was completely destroyed. But they actually towed it to their Ford operating base just out to Baghdad um, because the ammo and fuel cells were cooking off for about four days. They just kind of pushed it off in the far corner while it just burned out. You didn't leave destroyed vehicles on the road because then it becomes a propaganda tool for the insurgents. Sure. Um, the vehicle was recovered back here in the United States, completely rebuilt by BAE, uh, and was actually the first artifact donated to us when we were building this museum back in 2007. Huh. So put your thinking caps on real quick. So we just walked up a big concrete ramp. Okay? Right. So imagine this building with no walls and no roof on it. A crane picked up that 36-ton Bradley, put it in place, and we built the building around it. Oh, wow. Because how else would we get it in here? Yeah. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. So it serves as a reminder of the operations in the Middle East from Desert Shield, Desert Storm, to Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and beyond. Absolutely. Two of the newer artifacts, if you look above the Bradley, that we received in the past six months, we have the Shadow UAV, the larger aircraft, and the Puma UAV. So those are two unmanned aerial vehicles that we currently use operationally uh, in the Army. And I know from personal experience, the Shadow is a tremendous airframe. Uh, day, the camera eye on it has HD quality, day, night, infrared, you can see about 20 miles, and it has a laser rangefinder on it. So very, very neat. And I can literally launch and recover that aircraft out of the parking lot. There's a vehicle that has kind of like a catapult on it, shoots it in the air, and then that same catapult, they can put it sideways, put two arms up with a net, and you pilot the operator will fly it right back into it. So pretty, pretty neat airframe. Well, you just walked 100 yards. We walked 100 yards. You were at the, the, at the, at the end of, our, of the exhibit. And yeah. again, it's been an honor and a pleasure to show you guys today. Um, pretty big deal that, that we have this exhibit here. And I, always, I always encourage people to come to this exhibit first and then go, go and see the other ones because it kind of sets the stage for um, that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty beautiful setup. And I know that um, it was mentioned that so normally if you're going to take this tour, there's going to be like, it's going to be with the lights that we've seen. It's with right. the sounds. Right. It's with you know you have you have action going on, but um, it also just with with the quiet. Yeah. It's still uh, it's still immersive in yeah. all the, the human faces, and you have these different elements of um, the equipment that was used yeah. and the setting, Absolutely. and you can see footprints in the mud. And, yep. You know, it's, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's it's a beautiful pretty tour. So um, when you have somebody come through, this is there anything that you recommend that they that they look for? They ask, is this something that is um, this is you can just walk through this freely, or you can get a tour when you come by. You can if you contact museum. Beforehand, you can uh, you can schedule a tour. Okay. Um, um, we because we do we have a, we have the training companies come here. We have veterans groups. We have school groups. We have you name it. Um, you just got to reach out to us beforehand. Um, um, and yeah, we're more than happy to, to to do that for anybody that comes here to the museum. Cool. Right on. And if they make a donation, we are a nonprofit, so donations are appreciated. That always <laughs> helps. Yeah. It helps pick, pay a light bill. And all Absolutely. Kind of stuff, so, yeah. yeah. Right on. Okay. Cool. Um, but. Uh, yeah, and I would just encourage, I know you, you, you're the folks following your channel, um, please come. We'd love to have you here. We'd love, we'd love to be able to tell you the story of the United States Army Infantry and when it's been doing it for over 200 years. And I, I just encourage when, when folks come to the museum, like you do this tour first, because then you can kind of see in very broad, on a broad scope of what the infantry has done over the past 200 years and it's intertwined with our country's history. And if this, this to me, if you do this first, this kind of fuels your desire to want to go through all the other galleries and into the details and, of certain time periods in, the, in our Army's history. Because it's all, it, you know, being able to showcase that, that the history of what we've been doing as, as the infantry for over 200 years. Um, and uh, this is kind of the, the broad spectrum of it. But downstairs, you can go in depth into detail, specific battles and equipment and weapons and all that kind of stuff. So cool. please, please do come. Yeah. We'd love to see you. It's a beautiful tour. It ties it all together. Thank you guys for walking the last 100 yards with us. And uh, I encourage you guys, if you can make it out here. So this museum, it's ranked one of the best, consistently number one, out of over 35,000 museum systems here in the U.S. This museum is free. Come in. You can schedule a tour. Reach out and see. There's so much. There is so much history here. And there's so much passion here from the employees and the volunteers that keep it going. So come on down to the Infantry Museum here at Fort Benning and walk the last 100 yards. I think there's a, there's a lot to see and a lot to learn. We have vehicles, we have our Bradley, because you know I had to have some armor. <laughs> I'm here for the yeah, infantry I story, know, but you I know. know. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> we gotta have some armor, so right. come by and see it. Walk the 100 yards for yourself. Like this video if you dug the tour. We're gonna see some more from the National Museum on this channel, but um, 
go ahead and follow the museum. I have their social media links down below in the description so you can see events going on here and things like that and other exhibits that might be available as well as looks and pieces of history through time that's presented here and some of their artifact collection which is tremendous. So if you dug the video, like it, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already and I will see you guys next time. Thank you for watching.